Hey, thank you everyone for joining us and welcome to Berkeley Labs STEM Career Talks. This is our opportunity to showcase different careers in STEM with Berkeley Labs staff and scientists along with colleagues from all over the world. My name is Lisa Batali and I'm the Content Instruction Coordinator for the K-12 STEM Education Outreach Program, which is part of our government and community relations office here at Berkeley Labs. As a reminder, we've turned on our live transcription. There's a button at the bottom of the screen that allows for closed captioning during the session. And we are also recording this talk to share with future students. For those of you uh, joining us for the first time, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory is one of 17 Department of Energy National Labs located in Berkeley, California. Berkeley Lab is known for its leadership in innovative research and team science and has been recognized with 14 Nobel Prizes and credited with the discovery of 16 elements on the periodic table. This year, Berkeley Lab is celebrating its 90th anniversary. So we are very excited to continue our series of spring STEM career talks. Previously, we had career talks on mentor-mentee relationships and the future of food. The recording from those talks, along with other recordings from last fall STEM career talks that cover topics like quantum science and art and STEM, can be found on our K-12 program website. As a little preview, in two weeks, we will be talking with researchers about technical innovations in renewable energy. We're scheduling more career talks to continue through May of this year, and we'll be updating our website and Eventbrite so you can see who our speakers will be for future talks. We are very excited today to talk with our panelists about how they share science solutions to the world through patents, inventions, and STEM startups. Our five panelists will first introduce themselves, talk a little bit about their career trajectory, and then we'll get into a discussion about their experiences and work. So please feel free to put any questions that you may have in the chat box and we'll make sure to get to them later on. So I'd like to get things started and introduce our first speaker. Robin Johnston is a Biosciences Strategic Industry Engagement and Entrepreneurship Lead and JV Director of Commercialization here at Berkeley Labs. So Robin, thank you so much for joining us and tell us all about your career and job. Sure. Well, you might wonder why am I on an entrepreneurship panel? I'm not really an entrepreneur. I do help entre entrepreneurs spin companies out of Berkeley Lab and also sort of uh, help companies that come, startup companies that wanna come leverage what Berkeley Lab has to offer. I help them uh, find you know, connections with researchers and negotiate those kind of agreements. But what I do consider myself to be is an intrapreneur. And what that is, is somebody who's inside a larger institution, um, but they still are entrepreneurial. They try to do new things in creative ways and basically fulfill the promise of entrepreneurship, which is to create something out of nothing, basically something of lesser value and turn it into something of great value. So that's why I'm on the panel. Um, next slide, please. So um, I fell in love with science because my dad was a researcher at NASA. He worked on composite materials that actually ended up in the space shuttle. And I always thought science was really cool because there's, it, it's about truth, right? You're trying to find out the truth. And I always thought business, eh, you know, truth is sort of subjective. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So I really love the fact that science, uh, people were really curious and wanted to know answers to think to you know truthful answers to things um then um as you can see my dad is here on the left and then I, in sixth grade i had this fantastic african-american female science teacher who was really my first female role model i have to say professionally she was so together so smart witty funny um so then that encouraged me to get further into science so when I graduated from high school, I went to the University of Virginia and I got a BA in chemistry, not a BS. Um, a BA is a Bachelor of Arts and you take fewer science courses because I also wanted to get a degree in philosophy. So um, anyway, I wanted, to, I wanted to do something in the humanities as well. So I was always sort of had one foot in each of those areas. So for those of you who are in that situation, my career path is kind of interesting. Um, so I worked in the lab, um, you know, and as I did more and more lab work in third and fourth year of college, I realized I hated lab work. <laughs> I love science, but I did not like measuring things out on these mass weights and I little teeny grains of, of uh, chemicals and I just did not like labs. So I, but I love science. So I had a choice either to be a theoretical researcher where I was mostly doing math and trying to figure out um, or 
you know, theory about science, or I could be, you know, something else to leverage my science to do something else and maybe closer to the humanities. So um, I actually chose the second path. Um, and I actually considered being um, a patent attorney at one time too, um, which you're gonna hear from Karen later. So then I went to George Washington University and got a master's in science, technology and public policy. So basically what kind of government decisions should we make to increase our science base and our science knowledge um, as a country. So I studied that for two years and that was really exciting. That was in DC, Washington, DC. Then I got a job as a science editor and writer for the Christian Science Monitor. Christian Science Monitor is not a religious newspaper, um, but it has that title. Um, it's actually, um, I, I was uh, edited when the, the space shuttle exploded, the Challenger exploded and I covered that story. I covered the first genetic field, genetically modified plant field trials. So that was a really exciting job. But, um, you know, after a couple of years of reporting, I, I wanted to change careers. So I got involved, I got hired at Berkeley Lab and I did everything from, I got hired by the tech transfer office. I did everything from, you know, marketing and then licensing, which is negotiating contracts, managing intellectual property, a patents and software. And, um, and started an entrepreneurship program. So the, the point I wanna make about this is, even though I didn't have formal legal or business training, I was able to leverage the UC Berkeley extension programs, uh, Berkeley School of Law. I took a couple law classes, classes. I audited um, the Hastings School of Law. I uh, audited a few licensing classes. So I'm a hodgepodge of things, but I put together a career that I really, really love. And um, on the left, you can see that's me and three entrepreneurs um, who went through a customer discovery program at i -Corps. And this, they are my first trial guinea pigs at leveraging these classes for Berkeley Lab researchers. And um, this, this um, person, Pete uh, from Sepian Technologies actually went through the Cyclotron Road program, which the other uh, couple people on this panel also went through. So now I get to engage with companies. Uh, I'm basically at the interface of the biosciences area at Berkeley Lab and everything having to do with companies, um, attracting them to, to have partnerships with us and also encouraging them to take our technologies and develop them into products. At Berkeley Lab, we don't develop products. We're not uh, geared for that. We basically have inventions that we then license out to companies. So that's a big part of my job as well. Um, so I've explained a lot about what I do already. I also work for the Joint Bioenergy Institute, um, which is part of Berkeley Lab. It's a $25 million a year uh, program. I decide which um, uh, inventions should be patented. Uh, I manage the patent timeline. Um, and basically I represent Berkeley Lab and JBay at all kinds of conferences. So it's really a fun intersection of science, business, and law. So I'd have, be happy to talk to anybody who feels like they wanna be in both of those worlds as, um, the other people on this panel have their feet in a, in a couple worlds as well. So thank you. That's it for me. Thanks so much, Robin. That's really awesome that you get to participate in all the fields and we look forward to talking with you more later on. Hey, so our next presenter is Parker Gold, who is the Chief Technology Officer of Intrafab. Parker, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so as Elisa mentioned, uh, my primary role is the Chief Technology Officer of InchFab, but I'm also a part of this uh, pretty awesome program that's run out of Berkeley National Lab called Activate, and there I hold the title of Entrepreneurial Research Fellow, and I'm the first of three that I think you'll hear from today, uh, but we have each have some pretty interesting stories. You can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so from a trajectory career-wise, uh, I grew up in the Houston, Texas area, and didn't really think that I was going to be involved with STEM that much uh, growing up, kind of the closest I got to engineering, maybe this sort of picture here, which is uh, attaching a shovel to a pair of two by fours to try and get baseballs out of netting. Um, and when I graduated high school, I was thinking that I'd probably be some sort of lawyer or something like that. Uh, but then uh, next, as I transitioned to college, where I went to Vanderbilt in Tennessee, I originally started out studying political science, thinking law was the way to go, but also added this engineering and actually started to fall in love with that much more than the, the law side. And in the picture here, you can see that, you know, when you do engineering in college, at least you get to come up with all these crazy projects. So this was a initial Google Glass before Google Glass existed um, with modeled by one of my friends at the time. 
And finishing college, I, I was interested in engineering and I thought patent law might actually be a good way to go because you're still interacting a lot with science and engineering, but I still had that lingering sense of uh, what well, being a patent lawyer might be interesting. So that's where I left there. But after finishing at Vanderbilt, I was fortunate to have an opportunity to go spend a year in England and get a master's degree at the University of Cambridge. And this was kind of a year to figure out what I wanted to do with myself um, for a career. And at that point, I decided that the law side really wasn't for me. And I was going to stick with uh, what I still do today, which is micro and nanofabrication. And then after that year in Cambridge, uh, I went from Cambridge, UK to Cambridge, Massachusetts, and got another master's degree and a PhD uh, from MIT. And there started to do the project that I still do to this day, which is building very low cost micro and nanofabrication equipment. And kind of that kind of transition from law to engineer to entrepreneur kind of happened, you know, in a wild and long-term manner. But now that I'm in that entrepreneur type shoes, I, I don't think that there's anything else that I'll be able to do in my life. You know, the amount of uh, freedom that you have to kind of explore what you want and, you know, create something from, from nothing is, is something that's, you know, really exhilarating. And I'm not sure that uh, anything else will ever come to match that. So uh, after the time in MIT, uh, I actually just last year, right before the pandemic started, uh, moved out in to the Bay Area uh, and have been enjoying what I can uh, during this more lockdown year. Uh, the picture is actually my uh, view from my office at Berkeley National Lab. So I can see like the whole bay on a nice clear day, which is amazing and a great place to go and sit out and uh, have lunch. But uh, with the projects that we work on at the company that I started, InchFab, we're trying to make micro and nanofabrication a much more accessible thing for anyone that wants to do it. Currently, it costs a lot of money. Maybe some of you have seen some of the news uh, recently about how um, there's been a lot of shortages in uh, semiconductor space. A lot of that is related to problems that we're trying to solve. You can go to the, the final slide. So uh, what we do today at, at InchFab is, is making these pieces of manufacturing equipment for uh, micro and nanoscale devices. So you can think of these things as anything like from your computer to stuff that's in your phone to there's a lot of them actually in, in vehicles. If you're viewing this webinar on a projector, uh, the projector that you're um, viewing it on is full of these types of devices that we make. Um, on the bottom left, you can see an example of actually what a single pixel from within one of those projectors might actually look like. And it actually physically moves around and it's uh, a very small scale actually. So it's about half a millimeter there. And you can make all sorts of other different microstructures that are useful in a wide variety of devices. Um, and also wanted to highlight it as well that uh, if this is something that really interests you, um, we, we like to have interns in and help work with us. And we like our interns then to become full-time employees of the company. And, and there's some examples of some projects that we've worked with over the last year uh, with some of our interns. I'm looking forward to discussing more. I think that's it. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Parker. And yeah, we look forward to talking more about it. All right. Uh, next up is Jesse Adams, who's the co-founder and CEO of Synopic. Uh, Jesse, you can turn on your camera. Oh, hey there. And thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. So uh, yeah, as the slide says, I, I am the uh, co-founder and CEO of Synopic. Uh, I, what I didn't write there is I'm also uh, a entrep an entrepreneurial research fellow at um, at Berkeley Lab at, with the Cyclotron Road uh, program. If you can go ahead and switch to the next slide. So I know everybody kind of has a uh, bit of a non-traditional um, path that is taking them to where they are today. Mine may be even more non-traditional. So I'm gonna go back to actually to when I uh, kind of graduated high school. Um, I actually had pretty much zero idea what I wanted to do coming out of high school. Um, I knew that I couldn't make a career out of uh, playing basketball, video games, and hanging out with friends. Um, so I jumped to college um, and just picked a major kind of randomly. Um, so I actually, uh, the first time I went to college, uh, went to Florida State University, which is a fairly massive school. Um, I changed my major uh, a couple times, did a little stint in community college and got my associate's degree. Uh, but did not actually end up finishing uh, my bachelor's degree. So I kind of switched from psychology to electrical engineering and then actually did international business 
um, and decided that uh, since I didn't know what I wanted to do, it made more sense to maybe work uh, instead for a while um, and also to actually play music with uh, some friends of mine instead. So I actually stopped going to college before I, I wrapped up. Um, then I took a really long time to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, I did full-time work, uh, actually was a credit analyst, which was you know, really not my thing. Um, I did television production, uh, which is a combination of uh, preparation and sales for a long time. I even did telemarketing and was one of those horrible people that calls up and asks you to sign up for credit cards. And then I landed on doing um, operational management for a company for uh, a number of years. So uh, well over eight years, I, I worked with a uh, franchise business to actually work with people. And I actually really enjoyed working with, with um, all kinds of people from our management team to the franchise owners to their employees and customers and really enjoyed the interaction of, of dealing with people. But I really missed uh, the time I spent doing um, electrical engineering and science. Um, but I was fortunate to have somebody as a boss who you see there in the bottom, uh, who was an earth science, a retired earth science teacher who had taught for 30 years. And uh, she was somebody I could speak to about um, really missing science. And she encouraged me to actually return back to school. Um, and so I gave up my career uh, as an operations manager, quit completely um, up and moved myself back to Florida. I was living in Virginia at the time and uh, went to finish my bachelor's in uh, physics. And I had the opportunity to work with a few um, really awesome uh, professors there who allowed me to get some, some uh, experience in research. But I was really inspired through, uh, for science and going back to school between my boss, my friends who had also taken the same path of returning to school, uh, finishing their bachelor's, and uh, they actually went and got their master's as well. So I saw that this could be done. And I also thought of the times of my grandfather, who was very much a man of science, who used to uh, play chess with me, but also taught me logic and things like this when I was too little to understand how useful it was uh, for my life and for my career. And following that time, I decided to continue on with my education after not doing school for a very long time and went to Rice University in Houston, where I uh, got my master's and my PhD in applied physics and had the amazing opportunity there to uh, work for two professors who um, I uh, did projects in imaging as well as uh, neuroengineering. So I was actually developing cameras that were designed to image the brain um, and uh, work under some really uh, constrained uh, uh, limits on how you could put cameras into a, a brain and take images and understand what neurons are doing. And it was really amazing and it gave me an opportunity to develop these cameras. Uh, which I have now spun out into a company that I joined with Activate. Next slide, Melissa. And so now, uh, to sum that all up, uh, now I'm actually working on developing 3D imaging technology for imaging and endoscopy and in working with medical um, in areas that cameras have not been able to provide 3D imaging uh, to before. And so um, I've been able to kind of transition my career completely to spinning out this company and now building this device that I hope will impact people's lives by helping to screen for things like cancer um, and improving everybody's life while allowing a, me to continue to develop this technology that I've had an opportunity over the last um, several years to work on. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jesse, and we look forward to talking with you later during our panel discussion. Our next presenter is Karen Chen, who is the Patent Examiner at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. So Karen, if you want to turn on your camera. Okay, um, awesome. Can you guys see me? Camera might be dark. I don't know if you want to turn it off, turn it on again. Oh, okay, I'll try that again. Is it working now? Hopefully it's on on my end, so. We can, we can hear you, um, but it's just not visually working. But oh. we can, we're going through okay. slides, so you're okay, okay. with that. <laughs> okay, well, hopefully I'll show up at some point. If I do, great, if I don't. Um, I look like oh, that picture right there. <laughs> you, you are here, you have shown up. That is oh, awesome, thanks okay. so much, Yay. Karen. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Okay, yeah, so thanks for having me here. Um, it's really been interesting even just to listen to all you guys talk on the panel. Um, so as the slides shows here, I am currently a patent examiner at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And so we're actually located in Virginia. Um, we're an agency, we're part of the federal government. 
at the Department of Commerce. And so actually the interesting about thing about the office is they allow us to telework. So I'm actually located in San Diego, which is great. Um, and I can do my job out here remotely. So um, as the government agency, we do issue patents. So basically, if anybody has any new technology or anything they want to protect their intellectual property with, it comes through our office. So um, if anyone's interested in learning more about the patent office, there's some links down there. Um, but so in the next slide, my trajectory was actually, I grew up in Los Alamos, New Mexico, um, which is home to Los Alamos National Laboratory. It is one of the sister labs to Berkeley. So Los Alamos is even smaller than Berkeley though. Like everyone who lives in Los Alamos works or has a parent who works at the lab. So pretty much uh, I just grew up surrounded by scientists. <laughs> I grew up in a small town, everyone pretty much had a parent who had some kind of advanced degree in science. And so even my own father, I just remember as a young child, he would always be doing these science experiments with me. Um, so it was just part of my life. And so it was something I really enjoyed. Um, and I was also very fascinated by, I think Robin had mentioned the same thing. And so for me, it was kind of just like this next logical step um, to just keep studying more science. Um, and so I actually went to college at MIT and I studied organic chemistry there. And I remember I kind of fell into it because we're required to take chemistry and you have to draw these molecules. And I thought that was really interesting. And it's kind of funny because now when I talk to people, they all tell me how they disliked organic chemistry. And I'm kind of like, I thought it was super fascinating because you could just see how these molecules transform. And I just really enjoyed learning about, um, I guess, that level of detail. But anyway, so during college, I did do some research in labs out there. And um, I enjoyed that experience as well. But like Robin, I was kind of unsure of how I felt about lab, but I really enjoyed the theory, the background, um, just seeing how applicable science is. I think that was the cool thing. You could see how you could use chemicals to make drugs that then affect the human body, et cetera. And so I really liked that aspect. I really liked seeing the impact of science in daily life. So I decided to continue on to graduate school. Um, I did do one year working at a pharmaceutical company in between college and graduate school, but I was always sure I was going to get to graduate school. So I was actually at Berkeley and I was in a PhD program. And I think it was there where I was like, you know, I just cannot be in this lab <laughs> as much as it seems to be required. And I kind of hit this point where I think after a year, I was like, I just don't want to be around the bench. I don't want to be around chemicals. Um, I've been doing it for long enough. I just have had enough. So I decided to get my master's um, in chemistry, just left the PhD program with my master's. And so after that, I had this little um, like twisty path because I was so set on science and I knew that's what I wanted to do, but I didn't know how to convert that into a career, if that makes any sense. So after that, I knew kind of I wanted to continue down the science path. So um, I actually was in DC. Um, I was working at the NIH. And I think for me at that time, I just wanted to see how I could apply science more to the real world, human body, et cetera. And at NIH, they do research on humans. And so I like that better, but then it really cemented the fact I just really didn't enjoy being in the lab. And so um, after that, I pretty much transitioned more into a desk job and that's what I currently do. And so originally I was at the patent office just sort of on a whim. I didn't really know what it was, but it kind of worked out because at the patent office, we get a lot of applications about new scientific discoveries. So I work within um, chemistry and whatnot. And so we get a lot of the new applications. We figure out uh, if it is indeed actually new or not. Um, and if it is, or if it is or isn't, how we can get the application to the point where it's patentable, 
quote unquote a pen. And so this is a lot of words. I understand that. Um, I guess the main point about this is just this is a little bit of details of the actual nitty gritty of what we do. But what I enjoy about the job is the fact that I do still get to read about science, but I don't have to do it. Um, I'm not the one in the lab analyzing the results, like working with the chemicals. I'm just reading about it, trying to understand it and figuring out how it compares to what already exists. And that's pretty exciting to me because it is on the forefront. Um, as you talk to other panelists and whatnot, or as I talk to more people, I see how important it is for people to have their intellectual property protected as they want to move forward and commercialize and build their businesses and whatnot. And so it is, I think the neat part is that I do get to be on that forefront and I don't have a law degree or anything. The patent office has its own training programs. The only requirement is you just need a science or engineering degree, um, interest in learning about it. And they do end up training you um, on the specific aspects of law that you need. So the other thing that was really important to me was in lab, I just was tired of always being bound by like my experiments. Um, I felt like I couldn't make plans because I didn't know how things would go because research is sort of new and innovative. You can't always predict your schedule. And so that's the one thing I also liked about my um, having a quote unquote desk job that I had more control over my schedule and I was able to work when I wanted, et cetera. And I can work where I want, which right now is in San Diego. So that is pretty much it. Thank you so much, Karen, for sharing, and we look forward to talking with you later. Okay, so our last presenter for today is Raj Baxa, who is a co-founder and CEO at Canvas. So thanks, Raj, for being here with us today. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I'm also another Cyclotron Road uh, Berkeley National Lab fellow, just like uh, Parker and uh, uh, Jesse. Uh, and thanks for having me, y'all, uh, again. So uh, next slide. Please. I guess, yeah, just like everyone else, um, you know, life is nonlinear. So I've had this nonlinear journey uh, ever since I was little um, to like now, uh, where in, when I was little, I was really interested in science. I guess what I'm doing now is more uh, engineering and business, which still has a scientific component. But you'll realize that the, the pattern throughout all this is that we live in these times where you can do one thing and you can go into a totally different field. Um, and there's a lot of good things that come out, come out of that is one of the common themes that, um, that I've learned. But for me, um, in terms of sort of my journey, uh, I grew up in Houston as well. Uh, and so uh, grew up in, growing up in inner city Houston, uh, sort of in a low income area. So, you know, we kind of grew up in poverty, didn't have too much money. I didn't even know I was going to go to um, college. And so grew up in a small business environment, uh, helping my parents run a business. It was a motel business. And, uh, you know, going through all the classes in school, I think one of the classes, of course, was science. Um, and I would be one of those people that would go read books at the library and just, you know, stay at the library for like a day. Uh, I was basically really nerdy. And uh, the thing was that I identified that I was able to pick up on science concepts uh, pretty easily. And it was something that I could put myself into for eight hours a day and I could obsess over it. Uh, until I get to like the nitty gritty answer. But the thing I started realizing is that there is no truth, absolute truth. Um, there's only, you know, hypothesis in science that you can continuously falsify. And so that's kind of like one of the things that got me into philosophy later on. And, and uh, when I went to college, uh, I got enough scholarship to go to college. I ended up going to University of Texas, Austin. Um, I did a bachelor's in physics. Um, and then I also did a minor in philosophy of physics. So at that time in my life, uh, when I was early in college, I had no interest in business at all. Uh, I wanted to actually just pursue sort of the quest of knowledge uh, and be more of a scientist. That time, my plan was like to go into becoming a, a PhD uh, level physicist um, to kind of like ruminate on like how the world works, you know, all day and then also philosophize about it. And so that was sort of my undergrad experience, but then sort of realized quickly that I didn't want um, to be poor <laughs> the rest of my life, to be, to be real. Um, and the career trajectory for professors uh, wasn't as sort of um, lucrative in the sense that like, you know, 
for a philosophy professor, the, the salaries weren't there. So I wasn't trying to pigeonhole myself. And so I also started realizing that if I'm going to do something, um, I wanted to have impact. And so at that time, I, had, I didn't know what impact meant. I just thought that using science and technology would result in some impact. In the times we were living in, you know, the 2000s, the 2010s, technology was permeating our lives. You know, you had Google, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, the big tech companies. Then you had like these luminaries like Elon Musk, right? Um, building Tesla and SpaceX. So science and technology was going through this renaissance period where it was actually creating massive, massively scalable businesses, right? They were having incredible impact. So I did a PhD, uh, started a PhD in nuclear engineering after working at some defense labs. Uh, one was Y12 uh, in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, uh, uh, right next to Oak Ridge National Lab. And I was kind of, kind of in this nuclear engineering field because I thought it was like a sort of application of physics. So did that for a semester at NC State, um, didn't like it, left that, uh, and I've been dancing for a little bit. So I actually left grad school for like a summer, summer 2015, uh, to go to India to participate in a dance reality TV show called Dancing to Dance. And uh, I made top 10 and I came back. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to give myself one more semester to figure out what I really want to do. At that time, I was kind of going through this like, you know, random walk of life, uh, had physics, had nuclear, but didn't know what I wanted to do with it. So did took some business classes, uh, did pretty well in the MBA classes. Uh, and so I was like, okay, I think I understand business enough. And I think one way to have impact is to go into a brand new field that I don't know anything about, but bring my brand new perspective using physics. And then try to use my business sort of skills that I had at that time, which was a small amount, um, and then you know start a company. So that was my goal. <laughs> Basically, find a PhD uh, route that, that way I can start a company. So I got an offer actually from the textile department at NC State um, to work on textile material science, mainly wearable technologies. And uh, fast forward, I did NSFI core and a bunch of other things and got to Berkeley Lab at, uh, for Activate Cybertron Road. Um, started a company called Function, which we're pivoting now into sort of Canvas, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, but the main thing I learned during, in my PhD was I really loved working on the future of apparel. It was a space that wasn't really being innovated on. Um, you know, our cars are smarter, our TVs are smarter, uh, our phones are smarter, but our clothes really hadn't gotten smarter as everything else around us. So um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of how I found myself into working on the future of apparel. Uh, during grad school, I worked on different startup ideas. Uh, one was like a, a heated back wrap where um, we basically made this back wrap and then got into Bayer's uh, pitch program, pitch to Bayer execs, uh, kind of fizzled out because couldn't find a right market fit for it. Uh, but it kind of got me into this phase of building things. And so I think that's really, really important um, if you want to be a creator to just create things and put them out in the world. Um, eventually what will happen is you'll learn skills um, and then something will happen where people want it, right? Uh, the second thing I worked on was uh, sort of smart undergarment for measuring uh, vital signs. So specifically electrocardiogram, EKG, so your heart activity. Uh, and then the third thing was uh, sort of like this foray into fashion, which was this idea that one day we'll press a button and we'll be able to change the color of our fashion or clothing so that you don't have to buy 10 pieces, you can buy one and you can solve this problem of you know, personalization and customization. So those are a couple of the things I did uh, throughout the couple of years. Uh, but what I've settled on lately is um, with, from pivoting out of all of those things uh, is this idea of um, you know, taking that color changing idea and then you, uh, bringing it to sort of a consumer realm. And so, now I'm sort of in more of the consumer product space. And so working on a brand new company called Canvas, and our mission is to decarbonize apparel and digitize your closet. So we all know that fashion apparel industry is, you know, creates a lot of waste. Um, it's a big environmental footprint as well. So the question is, you know, how do we reduce that footprint while still enjoying that basic human need of expression and you know, having clothing? And so the concept here is if you can have uh, digital books, right? You can, it's more convenient and it's less waste because electrons are cheaper, you know, to ship than atoms, right? And so the idea here with cannabis is that you'll be able to, you know, have these erasable garments. So we're starting with t-shirts. So we're creating this uh, t-shirt that you can erase, which has a display on it that um, you can print with a printer. And the way it gets printed is with light. And so the printer looks like a document scanner. You put your t-shirt in there. 
and then um, press print and then print it in a couple minutes, as opposed to you know you buying a T-shirt today and waiting two days on Amazon. So it's it's a brand new product. Um, there's a lot of risk in terms of technical risk. Uh, we're at sort of the prototype stage, but the idea is that one day, you know, we'll, this will be a standard where we won't, you know, go to the store to buy t-shirts. We'll live in a world where we'll download the design we want to wear. And then, you know, just like we have a digital library on your phone or, you know, digital music in your phone, um, you have digital clothes in your digital closet that lives on your phone. And then you can print the design anytime you want. And on the other side, you have any creator in the world come on and then be, you know, able to sell their designs on the marketplace. So, the company we're trying to create is kind of similar to what I would call a Kindle for apparel. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's kind of what we're working on, um, more sustainable uh, and more personalizable clothing. Thank you so much, Raj. And so now um, I'm going to ask everyone to come back on and turn on their cameras so we can get our panel discussion started. And just a quick reminder to our audience that you can put in your questions into the chat box and we will be happy to answer them. Okay, um, thank you everyone again for joining us today. And, oh, there we go, I can see everyone. So it was awesome to hear from everyone, all of your um, different backgrounds, different stories. But I think the one thing that sort of unifies all of you guys were, you know, you guys do have a STEM background, which is interesting to think about in terms of entrepreneurship. So what are the advantages of having um, the STEM background for your position? And so I'll first ask Parker to answer that. How does having a STEM background help? Well, I, I, I first, I think it is, gives you an opportunity to go into a wide variety of fields. So you've heard from each of us that have very different paths and uh, some of us have changed paths quite a bit, but you, when you kind of have a, a level of STEM education, you get exposed to a lot of different kinds of ideas. And uh, when, you, when you have that, you're gonna be able to better navigate the, the different waters that are involved in starting a business. So. You don't have to just wear one single hat and be very good at one single thing to be successful in starting a business. You're going to have to be able to do a lot of different things. And some of those experiences that you've had in you know, getting a STEM education is very helpful in that. Thank you. Uh, Raj, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, so to echo some of the points that uh, Parker made, uh, I do agree. I think so we, you know, I like to put it in context of the times we live in and it, we kind of live in, in some sort of like a renaissance period, so to speak, or something similar to that, because if you look at the history of, you know, Silicon Valley and just technology development in general, um, it's been permeating uh, throughout every facet of our lives. And STEM allows you to uh, understand that at sort of a deeper level and then contribute to that progress uh, that's being made. And from a practical standpoint, if you just look at all the data, uh, STEM salaries are higher, our career trajectories are, uh, there's a lot more career tra trajectories you can go, go through, um, you know, being a patent examiner, a patent lawyer, you can go be a, um, you know, startup founder, you can be a professor if you want, a researcher, there's so, there's so many engineers, of course. So STEM is sort of like the future. Um, and I, I do also believe that humanities has a, a part to play where you know, for example, in my case, I, I kind of majored in philosophy as well, minored in, in, in philosophy. And so having sort of a hum, humanitarian, I guess, lens, so to speak, also accentuates your, your, um, your STEM background and your technical background. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, that's kind of what I would think. Thanks, Raj. Yeah, it's a com combination of STEM and humanities. That's a really good point. Um, and also the same question to Karen, uh, you mentioned that you want to get away from the bench and now you still get to apply your STEM background. So it's definitely an advantage to have that STEM background for your position. Oh, definitely. Actually, you can't even become a patent examiner unless you have a science or engineering degree undergraduate. And within my area, they do like more advanced degrees in the life sciences. Um, I am actually still looking at like organic chemical molecules and I'm seeing, you know, what they do with them. Like I don't do nitty gritty, like into like how test results, that's more FDA, but I definitely, what I liked about my job is 
I felt like I'm still applying what I learned, maybe not as broad because I learned about a lot of different areas of chemistry and patents. What you're trying to do is kind of distinguish one application from another. It's kind of like a property right in a way, but it's an intellectual property right. So I'm trying to draw boundaries for people. So I do have to have a very like strong, I think the stronger understanding I have based on my own um, background in chemistry, it really helps people who are applying for patents because it gives them a much stronger patent and um, a quote unquote intellectual property right for what it is that they actually have. That's good to hear you got to still be with organic chemistry. Um, I know, <laughs> it didn't go totally to waste. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so uh, then sort of moving on to talking about, you know, career trajectories as we're just touching upon, um, you know, as you all went through it, there were definitely some mentors, some classes that seemed to be influential. So um, who or what were significant factors in you getting this kind of work? And uh, first I'll ask Robin, because, you know, you mentioned about your dad as a researcher at NASA and your science teacher, were there other mentors or can you speak more to how their mentorship was helpful in you getting into this position? Yeah, so that sixth grade teacher really inspired me. I think actually if she had been a philosophy professor, I might've gone into philosophy because I just wanted to be like her um, in general. But um, she, yeah, that was a big one. My dad was a big one and all my, my dad's friends were scientists. And I love the conversations that they would have. It wasn't about people, what people were doing. It was about things and, and creativity and innovation. I um, mean, I always migrated to my dad. You know, when we'd have, my parents would have dinner parties. Or I'd migrate to my friend, my dad's colleagues, which who were men and women, but I would always migrate to that side of the, of the room. Um, I think later on, one thing to think about too, is when you um, are in school, in grad school or undergraduate school, develop, um, I, I made friends with a couple, I, I made friends with my PCHEM, my physical chemistry teacher, which I did not like PCHEM. I loved organic chemistry like Karen, but I made really good friends with my PCHEM teacher. That was my hardest class. And I would go to him and make sure that I was understanding and ready for the test. And so when I needed a letter later um, that talked about my chemistry ability and, and resilience, he, he wrote that letter. So I would just say, if you do, you know, make friends with your, your, your professors um, and your TAs because they can be really helpful later. And I had a couple college professors like that. Some were just awful and tyrant, tyrannical because I was in, went through like the pre-med, I was in the pre-med classes and some of you all may have experienced that too, but they were just terrible. They were just trying to weed people out and it was, it was not constructive. If you go to a big school, that, that's more likely to happen um, than a small school. So um, something to keep in mind, but yes, I had, I had mentorship. And then when I got to Berkeley lab, Jay Kiesling has been my champion um, and he's a well-known synthetic biologist. He's been my champion from day one. Uh, we just ended up meshing. So, and I just admire his work so much. So he's, he's another kind of role model mentor. So thanks for sharing Robin and for the good advice as well about thinking in college and grad school. Uh, Jesse, you also mentioned a couple of your uh, mentors as well. Is there more you can talk to about that? Sure. Um, yeah, I kind of mentioned, uh, you know, my grandfather was one that actually uh, really inspired me, but it didn't actually hit home until I was much older. I didn't realize what was happening. Um, you know, I, when I was little, I wanted to do science and engineering. I have like terrible spelling of wanting to be a scientist and great crayon images, but um, as I got older, I think the one thing that, that struck me was actually just having people around you, and Raman kind of mentioned, it's people that build you up are, are, were the most important to me. And that, that came in the forms of, you know, in form of friends. Um, it came in the form of uh, professors. When I went to community college, for example, and I got away from this huge school, and I was able to interact with some of my professors much more, I was well more encouraged to kind of follow a path that I was interested in. And, and they supported that. And the same thing happened when I got to, to graduate school at Rice, which is a, is a fairly small school, uh, under 6,000 people, uh, students, excuse me. Um, I was able to work with the professors. And so the two professors that I worked for, I could have conversations with and, with, and they were extremely uh, motivating um, to just be able to have interactions with people who have gone through it and have the experience made a huge difference uh, in my trajectory as I was coming out of grad school, especially. Thanks for sharing. 
just got a question in from our audience. Uh, for a high school student interested in science who thinks they want to pursue science as a career, what would you recommend? A more classical classroom approach or maybe STEM work experience? So between classroom experience or like uh, classrooms, you know, like learning the content versus actually going out there and doing some work experience. And this uh, students is in particular in AI and CS. Um, Anyone want to answer to that? What would you recommend? Classroom or work? Or both? Well, I can uh, step in for this. Um, so what I think I have been thinking about is just like the future of education in general. Um, and I think this is probably one of the best times to pivot, you know, in, in terms of like what that really means for society and actually analyze that. Um, till now, we've been through institutions, like bigger centralized in institutions. So you go get an uh, undergrad degree, and then you go work, and then you have like internships in between. I think we're living in a world continuously where, you know, everything's on the internet. And so in this global internet society we live in, um, sometimes the classroom, you know, instruction you get may be outdated by the time a technology comes out because technology is changing incredibly on a sort of basically exponential scale, right? And so we as humans think linearly, so it's really hard for us to grasp. So what I've realized, you know, from all the studies I've done and like, I guess, taking all the classes, the most I've learned has not been in the classes. And that's maybe because um, I learned a little differently, but I've learned a lot more from doing things. And so if that's the type of uh, person you are in terms of your learning style and curve, I would suggest portfolio, like focus on a portfolio, create a website, put it out there and then start working on projects. And then the more projects you work on, the better. And then of course you can supplement with like, you know, typical instruction in the classroom. But if you really wanna do things in the physical world or even the virtual world for that matter, um, doing projects as opposed to focusing on exams and stuff is gonna have more value, like in terms of long-term value for you and your skills in the marketplace. Um, also career-wise, you, you'll be exposed to a lot more ideas and a lot more people as well that you can work with on projects. So. I can add on to that if, for really quickly. I, I wanna kind of echo what Raj is saying a little bit there. It, this applies especially to CS and, and AI, um, and I work in, in that side of things, is that um, that is a particular field that you can really do a lot without school. Uh, that said, I think it's good to have a balance um, because, uh, you can, you can get a lot out of school, including networking and, and getting connected with people, which is also really useful from the university. Um, but for CS, if, you, if you're very self-motivated and you can learn on your own, I, I agree 100% with Raz, you can really go out there and start getting experience. Real world, real world experience makes a, a ton of difference in that space and working on projects really can, can drive you forward. Um, if you're in more of a hard, hard science space, then you may need that environment. If you're doing physics or chemistry, um, you may not be able to get access to the equipment that you, you might need to learn and grow. So there's kind of two sides that you can you know, work with on there. Well said, Jesse, echo that. Thanks so much for answering that um, and for the really good insights from uh, both of you. Um, and just to sort of add on to that question, also thinking about, uh, you know, are there programs, you know, resources, books out there that could help students who are thinking, let's say, in terms of, you know, on going into entrepreneurship or this these fields. And um, Karen, I do believe you shared with us some resources uh, from USPPO. Uh, I will put the link to our website. We posted a PDF of what Karen has shared, but. Would you like to talk more about, you know, the resources that you shared with us for students interested in like patent law? Sure. So I think um, the USPTO website, the way it's divided up is they do have resources for inventors, people who want to just learn a little bit more about the patent process. There is a section specifically geared towards K through 12. Um, it's under education and then students. And then th that's more tailored, I think, towards that level. It's a broader overview of IP. There's a lot of details and a lot of information at our website. So that kind of breaks it down. It also gives names of inventors. Um, there's a lot of people you wouldn't have guessed actually own patents, that sort of thing. And also at our webpage, 
and I know it's very big and bulky, but I actually work out of the Silicon Valley office. It's the regional office. And so um, if you go to that website, there's also some links to events. The patent office does do a lot of educational events. We do seminars just about various aspects of patents, trademarks, um, just overview of intellectual property, et cetera. If you just are curious, I also know the patent office does you decide to look into becoming an examiner, uh, they do externship programs. So that's also on the website. And I know like within our office, we also have um, K through 12 programs. We've um, given to elementary schools, high schools, et cetera. So that is all available at the PTO. And it's just to help people get an idea of what intellectual property is. Because <clears throat> um, I never knew what a patent was. And even now I'm learning it, how much it actually covers. Intellectual property is patents, but it's also like if you develop a cosmetic and you have a formulation, you wanna protect that. Um, just those little nuances. If you have a restaurant, you're trying to maybe like have a name and it ends up being big, uh, that's something that would eventually also you'd wanna kind of claim that space. So it, intellectual property is, much wider than what I realized, and I never even thought about it growing up. So, but thanks it's all sharing. available at our website. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for sharing the website with us. I'm happy to pop it up in the chat box. Um, and just to follow up in terms of programs and resources, maybe thinking in terms of the startup side, um, Parker, Roger, Jesse, has are there any resource or programs you can recommend to students who might be interested in pursuing? That field. Um, there are two books that I found very interesting. Um, one of them is called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Um, it's not a, necessarily a book about like getting into entrepreneurship, but it's kind of the problems that you might have when you're in there. And but it gives you a good perspective of what you know life as an entrepreneur entrepreneur might be like. And I think you know it does a good job of kind of laying out those things and the issues that you're going to face. And then the second one, a little bit different path, but one that's always struck me and I try to recommend to everyone is it's called 50 Things That Made the Modern Economy. It's written by this guy named Tim Harford, who's a podcaster and economist. And it's you know, 50 pretty basic inventions uh, that have really dramatically changed the world. And the way that those interventions came about and how people came up with them and like identifying a problem uh, was really inspiring to me and kind of, uh, I think, to anyone else who's kind of interested in this sort of field to go out and how to look at the world and see what problems you might encounter and then think about how you might come up with solutions to that. And I'll type that, I can type those in the chat box or I can send them to Elisa and she can add them. Yes, that would be very helpful. Thank you for sharing those two books. Um, and just to sort of uh, move on to thinking about what is it really like in your job? So what's the day-to-day -day like? Um, is there flexibility in hours or is there not? Um, just to sort of kind of have the feel. Um, Robin, you mentioned there was so much going on. You know, you're working on patents, you're working with various stakeholders, you're attending conferences. Can you sort of give us a look into the day of a life <laughs> and your job? Oh, wow, yes. Yeah. So there really, there isn't that much flexibility because I want to be available when companies are in operation and when all my the people that are inventing and going through the entrepreneurship programs when they're mostly working. Um, but I've all, I think it's really important. Uh, I actually work later because when you're an entrepreneur at Berkeley Lab, you're not allowed to spend your Berkeley Lab time on your side job as an entrepreneur. So I always talk to those folks like after hours, like after dinner or something like that. So. It's actually working more than nine to five, but it's really fun. Um, yeah, my day is I do, I wear a lot of different hats. So I could be um, looking at this really cool new invention, like in the morning and figuring out the strategy for managing that. And the afternoon have a call with a crop engineering company that um, may want to get connected to um, a postdoc or somebody who might either want to work there or has some an interest has an interesting publication that they might want to do collaborative research to you know talking to UC Berkeley about how we can leverage their entrepreneurial resources for you know our spin out so 
yeah, it goes from very picky detailed work like analyzing inventions and more like what Karen's doing to broad business development and meeting a lot of people. So I'm definitely a generalist and my job is really fun because it's always changing. And by the way, if you're, in, if you're like that kind of thing, um, this career is kind of called technology transfer. It's not, it's not a word I had ever heard of when I was growing up, but you can do it for universities, you can do it for DOE labs, um, and, it, and it's a really fun, creative job if you make it that way. So I can, I can follow up from the, the startup perspective, and I'm not going to speak for Raj, but I know that he also goes through this. We're, we're solo founders, uh, essentially, um, and that means that we wear all the hats. Um, and so we are the engineers, we are the business development people, we are the sales people. Um, and so um, it's, you know, it's not necessarily a set of skills that we just naturally came in with. It's something that we pick up and learn and go along, but we, we have to wear everything, at least for now. Um, and the idea is that hopefully both of us are successful and we grow and other people will take on those other positions, but it gives an opportunity to learn like all these different aspects of business and also look at the science and engineering right now for us, um, which is fascinating. It's a lot of work, um, especially at the beginning. And so um, like if I look tired, you see me drinking coffee, it's because I still have a lot of work to do today. Um, but uh, it's been for me extremely rewarding. I think Parker alluded to it I, uh, before. I'm not sure if there's anything else I'd rather be doing, um, but it's a lot of work. Um, no doubt about it. Thank you both for sharing the enthusiasm. And definitely um, in the introductions, all five of you were so enthusiastic talking about what you were currently working on now. I think that really came through. Um, and so we're just about a minute left. So just the last question that we like to ask our panelists in our STEM career talk. Um, thinking back to when you were in high school, what sort of like quick, short advice would you give to yourself? And um, we'll just go around. I'll start with Parker, then Karen, Robin, Jesse, then Raj. Uh, the advice I'd give to myself is, is don't try to make too many decisions about where your life is going to go while you're still in high school. You have plenty of opportunities to you know, make a decision, go with it for a year or two, make a totally different decision, and then go with it for multiple years. Uh, fortunate that we live long lives, and you'll have many opportunities to try different things. So. Do something until you don't like it and then change it. Is that me? Um, first plus one to what Parker said. Um, second, and I'm not sure I would have listened to me now, but would I would tell myself to actually listen to some people that are experienced, which I really didn't want to do when I was in high school, but really listen to people's stories and, and try to learn from them uh, because experience does make a difference. Of course, I didn't want to believe that when I was, you know, 15 through 17 uh, or 18, 19. Um, but it really, you can really learn a lot from people and, and try to keep your mind and uh, ears open. Uh, Karen, do you want to speak to sure. give yourself some advice? <laughs> Yeah, I think I would echo what you guys have said, which is basically you don't have to have it figured out. You're in high school. Um, study what you find interesting. There will almost always be a path for you as long as you pursue what you enjoy. I know that sounds really cheesy, but it's true. I think you have to like what you're studying in order to keep moving forward with that. And I also think... Um, you know, for me, I was always like, oh, I need to figure it all out myself, blah, blah, blah. But I really do think talking to other people, um, letting people help you. I was always, I've always been pleasantly surprised in my life at how willing people are willing to talk about themselves and try and help you as you are kind of progressing along. But yeah, I just would tell myself, you're not going to have it figured out and you shouldn't worry too much. So Robin, do you have some advice? And then Rod, you can finish this off. I guess things are just changing so fast in the world, Tech, the new technologies all the time. I would say just stay really flexible. Um, don't just be prepared for change, embrace it, and know that you're gonna land on your feet as long as you're eager and curious. So stay curious your whole life and you'll be fine. Yeah, so uh, to echo some of the points made, um, I mean, I totally agree with it, is uh, build a network, like just talk to as many people as possible. Um, you know, people older than you, people younger than, you know, like across the spectrum, 
um, build relationships and then also build things. Like if you're someone who likes to make stuff or um, whatever that is, uh, just start making it and putting it out into the world. Um, I think that's the cool thing uh, about the times we live in. We can just make anything we want nowadays. The cost, the barrier to entry is like really low. Um, and so, yeah, just work on many cool things. You know, you don't know where it's going to go or that where that experience is going to come in handy later on in life. Thank you everyone for the awesome advice. And we are unfortunately out of time. So I just want to thank all the panelists again for um, being here today. I want to remind everyone again that the recording of this career talk will be available on our website, um, which is right here. And just thank you again to panelists for your time to speak with us. We learned so much about it. It's really exciting. And I hope students are definitely inspired by that. Uh, thank you so much to our audience who joined us for this past hour. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Goodbye.